Good morning. What a great day to be together today. Welcome to all of you who are here this morning. So glad to see all of your faces. And know also that we have others with us today online. Glad that you're here as well. Uh, if you got your Bible, you can go ahead and be turning to Philippians. Uh, we're going to be picking right up where we left off uh, last time we were together. Um, getting near to the end of this letter. We're in its final chapter and near the end of this series that began our year uh, this year. Philippians chapter 4. So, one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, uh, Rocky Balboa from the movie Rocky, once said this about being a champion. He said, every champion was once a contender who refused to give up. He also shouted Adrian a lot in a loud voice and proved that nobody needs to buy a Stairmaster. Just let the world be your Stairmaster. But it's this quote that I want to talk about today. Every champion was once a contender who refused to give up. In a way, I think this quote kind of goes quite nicely with the passage that we're going to be looking at today from Philippians, which is a passage about laying claim of victory. This is a passage for champions and those who would seek after the crown of life, as it were, in our lives of faith. But before anyone becomes a champion, as Rocky reminds us, before anyone claims the crown, they must first be a contender. And that's what our passage today says as well. This passage addresses contenders who want to be champions. It's Philippians 4, verses 1 through 3, as we just read a moment ago when Tom was reading the scripture for us and would encourage you to follow along in this. Uh, we are getting to this passage just slightly out of order because we covered verses 4 through 7 last Sunday. That was so that we could have that focused time of worship that we spent last week, and I hope that was enriching for you. But you can't skip over these verses from Philippians. Philippians 4, 1 through 3, it, it's really, really important to the purpose of this letter. And some people have gone so far as to say that the entire letter leading up to this was building toward addressing this thing that we find in these verses. There's, there's, this, there's this concrete problem that needs to be dealt with. So what we have here is quite important in these verses. And they say this. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. So this is what Paul has to say in our passage this morning. And now that we've read it twice, actually, in just a matter of a few minutes, you might be wondering... Well, what does this passage have to do with champions and contenders and Rocky Balboa? And, and, and what does this have to do with our lives of faith? How could a little passage like this be so important to Philippians? And why should we care about Yodia and Syntyche and Clement? Who, who are these folks? Why should we care about them? There's a lot of reasons that we should care about these people in Philippians whose names you may or may not have heard before. Uh, probably the biggest one is that they might show up on a matching quiz at the Sweetheart Banquet at some point down the road. You never know which obscure Bible characters are gonna, you're going to be quizzed on uh, down in the future. But in addition to that, these real people here that we learn about in verses 1 through 3, they teach us a really valuable lesson for our life of faith. And these verses remind us, as much as anything, that there is a hoped for future in Christ. There's a victory 
that we need to be striving after, that we want to be ours. And it's the very same victory that Paul was talking about just one chapter earlier when he said that he's forgetting what lies behind and straining toward this goal, the goal of the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Like that's the hoped for future that we're looking toward in in Jesus. It's the prize, as Paul calls it. And these verses that start chapter 4 bring us back to that thought in a couple of ways. In two ways, actually. It brings us back to this thought of the goal. One of those is is right there at the end of our passage, uh, verse 3, where Paul mentions those names that are written in the book of life. And isn't that a thought, a picture to hold in your mind? Names written in the book of life. It's a reminder of the the victory, a reminder of the prize. Another one of those reminders comes in verse 1 when Paul calls the Philippians, my joy and my crown. And when you and I hear that word crown, we might first think about it in kind of like a royal sense, like a queen or a king might wear a crown. But that's not the word that Paul uses here. Paul Word, the word Paul uses here is more like the wreath that was laid upon the head of an athlete in the ancient Greek Olympics. You think about those who competed in the games and they compete in order to receive this wreath, this, this crown that would be placed upon the head of champions. This is what they would be striving for. It was the marker of their ultimate achievement, their victory, the prize, the crown. And this idea of a crown in this sense is one that the New Testament uses to spur us on all the time. I think it's used 18 different times in the New Testament all throughout the scriptures to talk about the ultimate victory of the faithful. So Paul talks about it in Corinthians when he talks about that crown that will last forever. Same thing. And Peter also, in chapter 5 of his letter, the crown of glory that will never fade away. That's what you're hoping for. That's what you may receive. John, in his writings, the same thing. He talks about those who will be faithful unto death receiving a crown of life. So these images of this crown are reminding us of this race that we're in, like athletes competing to be champions. And it draws our minds toward the ultimate victory, the ultimate prize. Also, I would be remiss not to mention, fun fact, my own name comes from this Greek word for crown. Uh, Another point in favor of the PH spelling of Stephen with apologies to one-third of our eldership. (laughs) I really just say that because there's one cool Mr. Steve around here, and it's not me. So I'm a little jealous in that way. But nevertheless, when Paul talks about this word, this crown, all the Philippians living in Greece are going to be thinking about the runner in the race, the champion who's seeking that prize, But we know, of course, that in order to be a champion, it's not just given to all who participate. And and certainly no athlete starts off as a champion just when they arrive at the door. Instead, we know that every champion was once a contender. Every champion invests the effort and strives and and puts in the work and and the sweat and the tears And I want you to notice that that's exactly how Paul describes the two people at the heart of our passage today. One of them is named Theodia. The other one is named Syntyche. And what Paul says about these two is that they have been contenders. They have contended, he says, together with Paul and with Clement and all of the other ones who are 
striving for the cause of the gospel. The word that is used here for these contenders is the word that becomes in English the word for athletes. That's what these ladies are in Christ. They are like teammate athletes striving together for the crown, for the victory. They are invested, Paul says, in the very same struggle that I am. We're all teammates in this, he says. So we should not think for a second that Yodia and Syntyche are bad people. Actually, they're actively serving and engaged in the gospel cause. They're the opposite of the stereotypical, like, just pew-sitting Christian. These are more like active teammates, you know, putting in the work, contending for the crown. But, of course, there is also one problem, too. And we don't know exactly what the root of this problem is. But what we do know is that these two teammates in the work of the gospel are, according to verse 2, well, they're, they're not of the same mind in the Lord. And that's a really big deal. After all, what has Paul been saying over and over again throughout this letter? His desire, the thing that would make his joy complete, would be what? To see Christians of the same mind. When he wants to point to the ultimate example of how to live, he says, look to Jesus and have the same mind in you that was in Jesus Christ. And then we saw how for weeks... Uh, in our sermons, we were looking at these concrete examples, after example, Timothy and Epaphroditus and Paul himself. And the whole point of all those examples was to show these people have the same mind in them. They're trying to have the same mind in them as Jesus Christ. But here, right at the end of the letter... What we find is that even good people, hard-working people, who set good examples by their active work in the gospel, even people like Yodia and Syntyche, can be thrown off track when they fail to see each other with the attitude of Christ. There's come to be some sort of disagreement between them. We don't know what that disagreement was about. You know, church, I think that may be for the best. It may be for the best that we don't know, because if we did know what the disagreement was about, you know, if we did know the root of the problem that's causing these two to not be of the same mind in Christ, if we knew the specific issue, we might be tempted to make this passage about the specific issue, when in fact... This passage has so much to teach us beyond just any one specific thing that can be divisive between one Christian and another. We find in this passage a more universal challenge. And maybe that challenge is this. To be a champion, you must first be a contender. But be very careful you know what you're contending for. And who you're contending against. See, Yodia and Syntyche were great contenders for the cause of Christ. But when they started to contend with each other instead, when they shifted their focus toward the fight with one another, suddenly it becomes a problem great enough that Paul felt the need to address it here directly by name. We may have even written this letter in large part to build up to this moment and try to address this conflict, this contention between two good believers. And isn't that the way that Satan can get the best of us? Isn't that one of the things he uses to so easily pull us off track? To be champions, we must be contenders, but 
whenever Christians fail to be teammates in the cause of Christ, work together for the crown, whenever we start contending against one another, well, that can do incredible harm to the church and to one another. There's a reason that so many of Paul's letters address this very same thing. 1 Corinthians has four whole chapters that basically amount to saying, enough with the divisions. Enough. Galatians says, serve one another humbly. The entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour each other, Watch out, or you'll be destroyed by each other. And in my experience, there are very few things more discouraging or damaging to our faith than when Christians bite and devour each other with harsh words or a divisive spirit. Whether it comes from our zeal to contend for Christ or maybe thinking that we're contending for what is true, whenever we lose sight of the people involved, there can be great harm there. And it's so easy to forget that it's a person with whom we may passionately disagree, an actual person for whom Christ gave his life, a person that Christ wanted to be your brother or your sister in Christ. It's a person that Philippians calls you to consider as better than yourself. Not an enemy. More like a teammate. So we need to be very careful that our efforts to be good contenders for the crown do not distract us somehow from the very race that we're running. And when we start to contend with our teammates, that's when we're set for trouble. Because, you know, there's enough to contend with already as people of faith. We face things every day that we must contend with. We find ourselves contending for peace in a world that is so fast-paced and causes such anxiety and disorientation. We find ourselves contending to cling to a purpose in this world that distracts us with so many things that don't really matter as much. We find ourselves contending with our own limitations, whether that's our physical limitations and the illnesses and struggles that we have physically or our emotional and mental limitations, the strain and weariness we face as we try to be faithful all day, our spiritual limitations when we sin and struggle to withstand evil. There's enough to contend with already without turning against one another. And if you've ever been the fan of a sports team, you know there's really nothing worse than there starts to be that fighting in the locker room. Because it's hard enough already to win the crown in the end. And it's that way with the church, too. So, instead, let's help one another to stand firm in the Lord. Let's remember to be contenders, but to do it together, like a team in pursuit of the same goal, the same prize, the same crown. Let's contend with one another, not against each other, so that our names may also be written in the book of life. Let's also remember this, that these things are only possible because of the way that Jesus contended for and not against us when he came to the world, even though we were at one time like enemies to God and his causes through our rebellion and our sin, still God chose not to look at us that way. And he loved us so much that he was willing to die for our sake. 
while we were still sinners. And it's in that that we know his love. He did not compete against us, but struggled and fought and gave his life for us so that we might share in his salvation. And maybe it's time for you to take hold of that hope today. Because of Jesus, it is possible for us to be set free and take hold of a crown of life because of what he did for us while we were still sinners. Maybe today somebody needs to respond to the gospel and take hold of that grace in your life. Be baptized in his name. Experience the love of the one who first loved us before we did anything to deserve it. Maybe the lesson for you comes from those examples from Philippians. Maybe you need to be reminded today there's enough to contend with already. So let's help each other out and not tear each other down. However you might be called or challenged, let's respond while we stand and sing.